morning and a very warm welcome from Talking Industry. Uh, my name is Andy Pye. I'm consultant editor at uh, DFA Media Group, and we publish a range of print and online publications dedicated to manufacturing and automation. I have four guests with me today, and we will be talking about um, Industrial Internet of Things, or IIoT, digitalization, and industrial communications. Um, digitalization and IIoT represent the next level of automation, um, triggered by the need for higher productivity and greater efficiency. But it necessitates merging traditional automation technology, which is known as OT, and information technology, IT. And it's IIoT that exactly makes that possible. So that's enough acronyms for today. And my speakers will be will be talking us through both the technical and the personnel implications of making that move. Um, before we get underway, um, just some basic housekeeping rules. Um, all of our uh, attendees, you're very welcome this morning. You're in listen only mode and you can communicate with us and with our panelists um, through the chat facility. If, you, if you're not familiar with Zoom, and most people are these days, the chat facility is at the bottom of your Zoom console. If you can't see it immediately, click on the three little dots um, on the more side, and you'll see chat as, as one of the options. You can then leave messages, questions, comments, um, you can even post references to useful documents in the chat. The only thing we ask is that you keep it non-commercial and objective. It, uh, only our speakers are permitted to, to post more commercial documents. But with, with the questions and with the documents that we post, we hope that uh, you'll get a really good reference document out of the chat that you can take away with you. And if you want to to hear it again, uh, we will be issuing an on-demand version shortly afterwards, and it's also made available in podcast format. So plenty of opportunities for you to hear it again and to share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to introduce our speakers briefly in reverse order. Um, so the fourth speaker you'll hear from is Luke Walsh, who's Managing Director of Brain Boxes. And he'll be talking about smart energy monitoring, uh, how uh, which is using I IIoT, and he's threatening to give us a brief demonstration of, of uh, one of his devices as well. So that's something to look forward to. Prior to that, we have Alejandra Matamoros. Um, she's Technology Manager, Manufacturing Technology <coughs> Center. She will discuss. Uh, again, the differences between the traditional methods of integrating production systems and what we can now do with IIoT and both the potential and the challenges of making the change. Um, I'm delighted that she uh, hails from Venezuela, which makes her not only our first Venezuelan speaker, which is wonderful, but in fact, our first one from South America. So we now have a full set um, and I'm relying on my colleague, Andy, who's behind the scenes there to find me one from Antarctica and then we'll have everything. Um, so I look forward to Alejandra's um, presentation. In second place, we'll have uh, the sales and marketing director of Novatech, which is Chris Barlow. And he is going to share what he describes as a hard one understanding of, of how data works, data flow, data generation, data management, data usage. Um, in a modern digitalized system. So that uh, that will be very interesting and it will highlight potential conflicts for money and people um, as you make those changes. And first, and very much not least, um, Jean-Paul Verheilewegen, and he's Global Sales Manager of MB Connect Line. Um, this is an IT security company which was acquired by Red Lion Controls in 2022. And some of you who've been on previous calls may well be aware that uh, Red Lion have, have appeared on a number of occasions in our past talking industry. And he's going to talk about the two parts to the IIoT project. Um, so how do you meld together people with IT knowledge 
um, who may not understand the data acquisition side and people with an OT profile um, who um, will have difficulties with the things that need some level of IT competence, such as managing cloud systems and so on, and how to get those two heads together. So uh, without further ado, um, I shall hand over to Jean-Paul. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Andy, for uh, inviting me today, inviting us today. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm uh, Jean-Paul Verredewig, and I joined our industry nearly 20 years ago. For the records, that was uh, <clears throat> when major suppliers were pushing uh, their customers to move from old serial networks to an integrated Ethernet architecture. And, and before that, I was working in the printing industry. And that one went also uh, through a technology-driven transformation. The technology back then was uh, uh, in the 90s, and it was desktop publishing. And it had a huge impact on, on people's workflow and, and habits. Today, <clears throat> when I look at our industry, the technology is IT in the sense IT communication. And it affects already uh, the way we connect, access, or, or visualize production data. And we're really going through exciting times now, as it, it is and it will be uh, affecting the way we work in a, in a durable way. Now, it has to be said, IT communication does not bring only good things to our industry. Um, our OT equipment is now connected, which means it's reachable, which means that its vulnerabilities uh, are more accessible and, and easier to exploit. But, but that's maybe a, a different topic. Um, as you explained, when, when I look at uh, industrial IoT, I see two parts in that project. Um, <clears throat> I see um, the, the first part about collecting data in the field from a variety of, of OT devices, scale it, process it, and then push it to a higher system. That can be a cloud or an MES if we are in a factory. The, the second part is about creating value out of that data and distribute that value to users. It's actually two different sets of skills that are required for, for each part. Um, people with an IT knowledge may have difficulties with data acquisition from the field. People with a more OT profile may have difficulties with cloud systems, value creation or distribution, because the tools that are used uh, there require indeed more, more specific IT competences. So the challenge that I see in the digitalization journey is very similar to the one that I see in IoT projects. It, it is to organize cooperation between expert people who have a limited level of technical understanding in the other part uh, of the project. And you will need to, to drive the project towards non-technical objectives here, value creation. So um, <clears throat> definitely for digitalization, I would say think big but then scale it into small steps like, like on the ladder. Uh, if the steps are too big, you won't make it and, and it will be uneasy and, and you might fall. Um, um, you know, besides the industry, I have a passion for, for coaching. Um, and the coach in me would say, um, don't start small, start smart. Uh, smart standing for specific, measurable, achievable, <laughs> realistic, and, and, and in a timely way. Um, because in the end, it is people who will do the actual digitalization journey, and they need to believe in, in every step they make. So digitalization is a team trail. Um, so I, I believe in empowering uh, OT people. I believe in truly verticalized products, uh, products that will harness the complexity of IT communication and IT security, and that will allow OT staff to operate safely and autonomously in their new connected environment. Um, so it's, it's no surprise that I'm working with MB Connect Line and Red Line Controls, because that's precisely the sort of products you will find in their catalog. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Jean-Paul. That's a very good introduction. And um, I will now... Um, open this up for, for a discussion but the way we work is that after each presentation we have some uh, some discussions involving all the panelists and we would very much like our attendees our registrants to uh, to join in as well so if you have some questions you want to raise 
please post them in the chat at any time. Don't just wait for the end like you might do with a conventional webinar. Um, my, my question for Jean-Paul, and I'll ask all of our panelists is, do you see this as a temporary issue? Um, will education systems um, bring the two um, closer together over a period of time, or do you see this um, being an ongoing problem? Um, an ongoing problem, no, because there is a lot to win uh, in, in solving this. Um, education, I don't know, but I see already in larger factories, um, people with an IT background who are directly involved in the maintenance of the <clears throat> of the production. So there are there are OT engineers who have uh, IT skills and take care of. Uh, um, um, of, of regular IT tasks um, <clears throat> like network management or, um, or, or user management, they, they're autonomous in that. Uh, what's missing, I, see, I, I believe, is um, uh, tools for people with less IT knowledge um, or, or less of those specific competences. Um, we're missing tools to, um, to, to have OT people to give OT people more autonomy in uh, in managing their the, the IT part of their connected and industry, um, it's coming. Um, there are there are products that are more verticalized um, that that harness already the complexity. Uh, I see that with uh, um, with interfaces for for managed switches designed for the industry, um, like with uh, red line controls. I see that with um, some uh, so, some products that that manage remote access in a more secured way. Um, so it it's coming. Engineering is already on its way. Excellent. Um, well, let me throw this to Luke um, and see what your experiences are. Um, in your customer base um, in terms of the way um, those customers are um, addressing the, the IIoT issue. Sure, uh, thanks Andy. Um, well, first of all, my, I totally agree with everything John Paul said, uh, but just to go back a few years, um, a few years ago, I was in the uh, television industry. And at that time there was a term called HD Ready. And I was working technical support for a major TV brand. And I was getting lots of phone calls from customers saying, how do I get my HD signal to my TV? There was all kinds of connections from the box to the TV. There was SCART, there was Component, there was S-Video, there was HDMI, and customers were very, very confused. And it's the same issue we've got today in, in this industry with IoT. There's lots of ways to do it. Some of the ways don't work. Um, some of the ways kind of work with caveats. Some of the ways only work in certain situations. And I think in a few years from now, we, we'll forget all about these issues we're having today. Um, today, if you want HD on your TV, you don't even think about it. You you buy your TV and sometimes you don't even need to plug a box into it anymore. It's just there. Um, but if you do need to plug a box in, there's only one type of connection and you plug it in and you're pretty much guaranteed to get what you want straight away. And so we, we see these same challenges today uh, with IoT in the industrial environment, there, there is a split between OT technology and IT technology, and both sides are trying to work with each other to understand how do I connect one side to the other. There's lots of different ways to do it. There's lots of different protocols. There's lots of different connections, different signals, different voltage levels, different machinery. And so all those same struggles exist, just on a, a much grander scale, to be quite honest. Um, and so... When we get technical calls today here at Brain Boxes, uh, we we kind of have to understand what the customer setup is in order to understand, okay, what's the next step for them to take to move their system forward. Uh, but I am sure five years from now, it will be a non-issue um, and, and less customers come to us with old machinery. Now that, that's the major difference between the commercial world and the industrial world. Uh, in the industrial world, people want their machines to last for multiple decades. In the commercial world with televisions, if you get four or five years out of a television, you, you, you're quite happy. So the, the turnover of equipment is the, the main barrier to, to moving forward quickly. Thank you. Um, Alejandra, do you want to uh, comment at this point? Um, we've got some interesting questions coming in, but I'll, I'll just save them for a minute until you've had a chance to speak. Sure, I can do that. Thanks, Andy. Auntie, I pretty much agree with all what 
have been said. Uh, and this particular point around the, the plug and play aspects and, and, and the ambition that we have to see in the future devices in the industrial domain also having those capabilities for actually easing the way that things are implemented is, is, is definitely an ambition. But, but I will say also it's a, it's a really long term ambition, even though we, that we see things that are actually happening uh, up to certain points with certain devices, say IoT sensors with specific capabilities. But if we think about the, the wider um, industrial application and the, the wider domain, so we talked about the longevity of equipment, uh, but also we need to think about the longevity of those uh, systems or infrastructures of connected systems. So that's what we need to start thinking about um, the, the very definition of OT and IT, not from the organizational perspective as well, because if we think about IT, IT, they have their own priorities from an enterprise perspective. OT, they have their own priorities from the operational perspective. And merging all of that together in terms of priorities and how that enterprise and operational uh, perspective is all combined in, in the same priorities is one thing that they, we foresee that is the direction for actually making this happen and making that established within the industrial domain. Yeah, so that, that's a very good answer. And it, it actually touches on one of the questions that's been coming in since you uh, you started speaking, which is which is the issue of how uh, how digitalization throws up challenges in a company to get everyone in the company on board. And that's that's a key thing that I think we'll discuss in more detail as we go on but um just chris to uh, to complete the circuit if you'd like to uh, comment on what you've heard so far yeah sure yeah yeah thanks andy um yeah i think i think to luke's point in his uh, closing remarks really the um i think what we find is i suppose the different kind of vintages between the the equipment in the ot space versus versus the it space um and i guess really the challenge is then with getting that equipment up to certainly in the OT space up to modern standards where even some of the connectivity is a little bit more up to date. I mean, we're still, we're still seeing systems that are 30 plus years old with um, serial connectivity and, uh, you know, legacy protocols and those kind of things really. Um, and I guess from, from an IT perspective where there's a very sort of different discipline or a, a maybe a, a, you know, a very different approach where, um, everything is refreshed much more frequently. The technology is much more up to date, and I suppose the the latest standards are, are adopted and applied to push those down into uh, the OT space, where where the equipment, um, you know, some of it might might be as old as I am, really. To get those two things to come together um, is is certainly presenting a challenge, and I, I suppose maybe the different ways that people that maybe spend more time in the OT space or are more responsible for OT equipment think that maybe differently than those in IT and just really getting everyone kind of on the same page really and thinking thinking along the same um, you know along the same theme. You mentioned the the issue of legacy systems you know and and uh, um, is that a particular problem in the UK uh, or are other countries more inclined to uh, to be investing in um, in more modern equipment and and not to have to deal with that issue would you say um i mean most of my experience is in is 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 in the uk um we do and and have worked in in europe as well and um, also southeast asia and other places like that but i think um yeah i think um one of the things i was going to say in my um um in my in my little sort of pitch later really was just about the investment in manufacturing i think i I heard on a webinar about 12 months ago that the investment in in manufacturing in the UK is at its lowest point since the end of the war or something. It's something something ridiculous that you can't actually believe is true. But I think that's um, you know that's what I heard. And I think the I think the experience is that maybe um, the the OT equipment or the or the systems that that kind of typically let's say sit in the OT space certainly don't don't get the same level level of investment as equipment that sits in the IT space and um, often gets disregarded the kind of the sort of make do and mend mentality really that if it's not broken then why why change it so mm -hmm. yeah I think I think that, that that probably is true that there maybe is um, more investment that could go in to manufacturing in the UK you have a, a 
a European perspective, Sean Paul, is is uh, how do you see that the the answer to that question? I would say it's similar everywhere. You, you will find differences, but uh, um, in the industry, you have a machine. The machine is paid. Uh, the um, the machine still works nicely. Uh, people are trained with that machine. They know how to handle it. Uh, you bring in a new machine because you need it for production. You need some of its new features, but you keep the old machine most of the time because people uh, are used to work with that machine. There is a know-how. Um, it will take time to bring um, people to to uh, to work with the, the the new machine and be as confident with it. So that's maybe one of the reasons. If you look at infrastructure, yeah, um, I, I've seen a deployment that takes more than ten years, and, and legacy systems that are twenty, even even twenty five years old, uh, even thirty years old in in the field. So um, yeah, we're we're really on a different uh, time scale here much more uh, conservative uh, or um, we have to work with uh, more legacy systems in, in, the, in the industry. Okay, well, let's go, let's move on now to Chris's uh, presentation on the, on the issues we're surrounding data management, data flow and so on. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, so hi, hi everyone. Um, so my, my name is Chris Barlow. I'm the Sales and Markets Director of Novatech Solutions. Um, we're a systems integrator, um, largely specializing in the delivery of what we call IT compliant OT solutions. Um, sorry about the siren there that you might be able to hear in the background. Um, and um, we certainly recognize the challenges with, with the convergence between IT and OT and what that's presented in a kind of manufacturing um, software context. Um, I've been in systems integration for about 25 years now, um, and with the background I have from a more um, from a more technical nature um, at, at Novatech, I'm largely responsible for making sure the solutions that we propose meet customers' requirements and use the right mix of products. We're um, you know we're very much product first, um, bringing those components together so that um, things like systems and things have got um, a great deal of longevity and um, are, re are really compliant. Um, over the last few years, we've, we've sort of seen and heard lots about um, IIoT and the potential benefits to manufacturing. But really, when we ponder what role IIoT plays in manufacturing um, and how the potential benefits can then be turned into, into tangible results, it then throws up lots of questions and um, lots of challenges as well. Um, so from, from a personal perspective, um, I've, I've been involved in lots of discussions where I think IIoT may be seen as a panacea, um, but I think the reality is without tangible use cases, it, it almost becomes a solution looking for a problem um, and its value certainly gets called into question very quickly, um, especially as the costs of, of things like pilot projects and those first implementations really start to escalate, which then then has people asking where does where does it fit then if it's going to be expensive and it's really is this kind of um, this kind of solution looking for a problem where does it where does it fit and add some value so um, then we start to think about we we get questioned around whether we should use IIoT to replace SCADA or whether it's a better replacement for MES um, and really customers saying, do we need all of these individual systems? Why can't we just use IIoT? Surely that can that can do all of these things. But I think really what I'd say to what I'd say to those uh, you know to those customers um, really is that um, those individual systems are really designed to perform a dedicated task um, and they they have kind of critical or they're critical to operational performance. Um, so SCADA systems, for example, that's about real-time visualization and, um, and, and, and control of manufacturing systems. And that capability may not be there with IIoT systems, certainly that, that kind of real-time control element. Um, and MES, on the other hand, is about bridging things like business systems and control systems and managing people and processes and all of the data involved in transforming raw materials into finished goods. And Maybe IIoT can maybe fulfill some of those functions, but I think um, if you were to use an IIoT platform to try to develop a custom MES from scratch, 
while in the beginning that might seem like a cost effective way of going i think over the long term you would certainly find that a much more expensive route and probably not really achieve the outcome that you would if you were using purpose built products for for those applications so i think really the message there is not 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 to go looking for systems to replace but maybe um it's more about consolidating the systems that you have uh, or augmenting functionality um, of those systems um and really trying to find a way of um i suppose finding something innovative and unique that the um I, 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 IOT platform can be used for in terms of maybe delivering some value back to the business and um, a more cost effective way of doing that without necessarily looking to to sort of rip out systems and replace them with um you know with something like IIoT. Um I'll just share a quick um slide if I may just to uh, wrap mm. up um uh, pictorially. Um I hope that's the slide deck that's now on the uh, that's now on the screen so i think yeah back to this um this use case driven um sort of idea really what i was um really trying to get across with this slide is that um the the kind of existing systems that we have right now that we typically see in our um in our manufacturing environments this um isa 95 model on the left hand side i'm not really sure that we want to think of IIoT as fitting into one of these layers and maybe then therefore replacing some of the some of the systems or capabilities in those layers. It's really about being something that can is able to consolidate information and, um, and to bring to bring data in from those systems and to solve specific use cases that may not not be there um, from those systems that you have. So either whether it's just aggregating systems together to share data or it's around improving um, around improving overall um the overall system system performance or individual asset performance maybe things like predictive maintenance we hear a lot about that these days and that's certainly a use case use case for iiot and and outcomes really there that we're looking for is is obviously things like increased uptime improved inventory management more efficient uh, use of energy and those sorts of things um and then back to the the point I made uh, earlier, just in terms of investment, I think um, if we're looking at ways of improving the the operational performance of our of our manufacturing facilities, knowing that the investment in those legacy systems is not always there to replace those systems, then maybe um, uh, maybe IIoT offers a significant advantage in terms of augmenting those systems and and therefore delivering some real value on top of uh, those systems that may that may already be there. Yeah, I mean, this is very interesting, isn't it? Because because on one hand, you know, the, there's there's the suggestion that, that the way to implement is to go for small steps, as Jean Paul mm -hmm. was saying earlier. And yet, a lot of these small steps are actually pretty self reliant. They are so. Um, how do you how do you create a business benefit or a, a business plan that shows a benefit, a tangible benefit, as one of our questioners has just said? when you can't take the small steps but you've got to take a more holistic view of the whole the whole business and that means looking not at small steps but a but a big plan so how how do you um how do you marry all those potential conflicts would you say and and this is a question i'll i'll pass around in a moment yeah i think i think from my experience um from what we've seen um, so far, then, for those use cases that that work, um, it's not it's not very easy to go into a conversation with a customer with a almost with an IIoT sales pitch and um, and go to talk to those about the things that you some of the problems that you know that IIoT may be capable of solving because they those problems may not be may not be relevant for that individual customer. So I think really listening and understanding what what some of their pains are and um, maybe understanding the systems that they already have in place and maybe whether there's elements of um, really consolidating and aggregating data from those systems to then solve a use case that may not have, have even have even been considered so far. Um, I know, you know, for, for kind of years and years, we've we've looked at things like reporting as ways of bringing information in from, um, you know, from disparate systems and to present information in a consistent way. Um, but that's 
usually kind of one directional. Well, what if we could actually make those um, that type of information a little bit more bi-directional and push information back to systems and therefore reduce the level of data entry that may go on? I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of processes that require information to be taken from one system and keyed into another. Um, that's obviously prone to error. You know, people can people can make mistakes and um, you know get get things wrong there. It's it's kind of inefficient. You're tying up resource in that process when they could be better utilized for something else. So maybe as a really simple use case, it's about maybe bridging gaps between systems and reducing um, some of that manual data entry or um, some of that error prone, you know, um, sort of keying of information really, and just having some some simple consolidation. And then of course you go right to the other end where we we can talk about things like predictive maintenance and, and augmented reality and all of those sorts of things. But I think from what I've found so far is really the um, you know the best opportunities um, are those that the the, the the kind of customers almost answer their own question if that if that makes sense. Once you get into a conversation around around IIoT, they kind of bubble to the surface and uh, largely present themselves. Mm. Luke, what's your view on on uh, small steps or big holistic plans? Um, I I think I think ultimately um, the guys who work on the shop floor they know typically what the issues are. The guys who work in the accounts department they know where what they're doing doesn't meet up with what is going on in the rest of the business. And so often, but also the, these members of staff. They can be skeptics of technology, right? We, we've all had projects thrust upon us, which we don't want. Um, and so the, before you can choose between a, a holistic approach or a piecemeal approach, you, you need to convert your staff from maybe digital skeptics to, towards being digital champions. And the, you, you can't do this overnight. You have to do this in a slow measured approach, unfortunately. So I, you know, I could impose a new uh, company-wide system here today but it would take months before it was embedded and during all that time it may not even go well and people will be pining for the old ways of doing things even if they're not as efficient as the new the new the so-called new way of doing things so uh, yeah what, what we try to do here is do start small because you won't get the buy-in from everyone unless you can see some results uh, and a really simple way of doing this. So we we did a, a project in a factory many years ago now where the maintenance staff were super skeptical of what we were doing. They they thought, oh, here comes another company trying to monitor some aspects of what we know all about already. Um, so we put in some very simple monitoring and actually the maintenance staff realized it showed them that the night shift weren't as busy as the night shift claimed they were being. And so the maintenance staff suddenly were on our side because for the first time they could go to the night shift with hard evidence and say, look, we can do the maintenance at night because you're not that busy. And so, you know, we could have started with a big project, but we'd have never got that initial win. And we'd have never been in the position then to move forward with the project with uh, the people on the ground on your side. And it's, it's almost not worth embarking on a big project unless you can find the, the steps you need to take to get buy-in from the team. Uh, so so that's, that's always been our view. You do need a champion within the organization who will push this thing forward. And you, a champion, it doesn't, it, they don't necessarily exist on the first day you arrive to do a project. You need to find that person who gets a win that they can move forward with. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, that's, that's our view. Um, yeah, we, like I say, we've all had projects where the, the aspirations of the project were great, but the outcomes were really uh, poor. And so we, you want to avoid that at all costs. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Jean-Paul for his, his views and then seamlessly move to Alejandra, who's going to hopefully answer that question and then transparently move into her own presentation. So right. Jean-Paul first. Yes, well, I, I would agree with uh, with Luke. Um, it, it, it is a, a team trail, as I said, and, and you need to have uh, um, management. Uh, you need to have the board with you. You also need to have the people on the factory floor with you. Um, and, and that makes it very, very different. So um, the, the step by step approach is, is the one that, uh, that that works and you will convince with the small results you have and then build build on that. 
Um, I, I see typically um, ma major showstoppers for many IIoT projects, like uh, uh, the first one is the return on investment. Um, the, the, uh, another one is uh, um, I, I don't master that technology. Um, so I will need to hire people um, or, or to, to hire consultants to, to, to do the job for me, but how will I control? I'm losing control on my, on my factory, on my machine. On, so these are all showstoppers. And, and it's, um, um, if you want to venture in the project, um, you need to, um, you, you need to see your path. You need to see your, your, your benefit. Um, uh, you need to perceive the value and you need to trust uh, the, the, the project or the project team. Um, and, and I would say building, building trust with results um, on, on the smaller scale, maybe start with just a monitoring thing um, and, and, then, and then build on is, is probably the, the, the way to proceed because then you build value at every stage of your, of your project. Of course, if all that fits a, a broader view, that's better, but you don't necessarily need to tell the broader view uh, to to the whole audience. You 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 start with with steps, and and that will build your complete project. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alejandra, do you want to comment on on the the small steps versus the holistic debate, and then uh, you can present your um your presentation following that. Sure. Well, actually, I cannot agree more with uh, all what's been said. Uh, but I would like to add to that uh, my my views and actually the, the approach that we tend to take uh, around that holistic view and is supporting manufacturers of any scale to understand that long-term vision, try to discover that, that long-term vision and that doesn't come with only bringing the seniors to that meeting. It comes with people, the key stakeholders from those processes people who actually understand which are the, the requirements, because at the end of the, day, of the day, what you need to get to is, is to have a value-driven strategy that then you can start eating or delivering in smaller chunks. Uh, and that's where the, the proof of value uh, starts being step-by-step. Step. One of the things that, uh, that uh, I think I'm going to touch actually on some of my, uh, my, my things in my presentation as well, is around uh, trying to avoid, to all extent, repeating the same mistakes that we have been doing within the technology environment. So even though the recommendation is to start small and do that step by step, avoiding ending up with one, two, three different IoT systems that at the end they won't get you to to maximize the value that you can actually get from exploiting all of that data and interoperability that you can generate up from that. Um, so start small, but do plan for that with a proper technology roadmap that takes you through that transformation journey. <clears throat> so with that, I guess uh, I will just move smoothly into, into my topic, which uh, actually fits really nicely. So um, uh, I'm a systems engineer as a background. Uh, so that, that's what I did back in the time seeing in university. So all of my description will have that, uh, that key um, systems component in the way that, that I describe and refer to things. Um, and uh, particularly in the MPC, we, we work with a breadth of technologies that at the, end, at the end of the day, what we look at is at developing systems from the manufacturing process perspective, but also from this uh, digital domain. So we cover a breadth of technologies from um, additive manufacturing, laser-based technologies, conventional machining, uh, but also going all the way up to automation, robotics, design for manufacturing or design for X in, in broader terms. Uh, I particularly work for the Digital Engineering Group, where we work uh, around modeling and simulation uh, to provide analysis, insights, optimization of product processes, uh, factory environments, cost modeling, things that are associated to, to the different um, uh, decision making points when it comes to any stage of, of production environment. Um, we also have um, a breadth of capabilities around uh, manufacturing informatics, and that's where all of these topics uh, typically fall in. So we have a uh, connectivity, data science, advanced visualization, computer vision, 
and you mentioned within that scope, the things just carry on growing. Uh, and a big um, and strong activity actually around um, quality assurance and uh, uh, methods and technologies around metrology and non-destructive testing uh, to support a breadth of requirements within the manufacturing industry. So we address challenges that span across um, a large spectrum of the manufacturing industry. So we, we were set in 2010 um, to, reach, to reach the value of death between academia and uh, the manufacturing industry. And we are part of the high value manufacturing category family. Uh, and the, particularly in the MTC, we cover sectors that go from our historical um, aerospace and defense domains all the way up to, as today uh, with uh, construction, infrastructure, space, and agriculture, and how we can bring manufacturing methods, manufacturing technologies, way of doing things in, in manufacturing and relevant to, uh, to the manufacturing processes into these other sectors. So my topic is, is, is today around hierarchical systems versus what is different in, in the IoT domain. So I want to start that by, frame, by framing it within the scope of networked industrial things or even hyper-connected manufacturing systems uh, and refer to these systems as the technological evolution from traditional hierarchical supervision and control of manufacturing processes of industry 2.0 and we touched on that uh, <clears throat> earlier in, in the previous talk uh, into a more multidimensional way of integrating things of the manufacturing value chain all of course within the pragmatic boundaries what, that we have been discussing about already so um, by hierarchical systems, we are then referring to those different layers where we touch on field devices, PLCs, SCADAs, manufacturing execution systems, uh, all of that integrated very vertically uh, through operational networks alone. And that's safer, and the, that's the most reliable way of doing things if you want to keep your production systems uh, alive. Uh, but straight to the point, what is wrong with those hierarchical systems then? So it's not really anything wrong, uh, they are just limited. So just as in organizational hierarchies, supervisory and control systems are rigid and typically lack of agility and are limited to the capability and the capacity of each hierarchical level. That is safe, fair game, and there is more control uh, from the top to the bottom, which is all what you, would, uh, you will decide to keep things going on in the production environment. Uh, but what is then that industry should bother with networking things in manufacturing in a different way. So IoT brings in particular two major technological offerings. On one side, data to measure, which is the effective and efficient generation of relevant data. So call it a product data, process data, environmental data, and delivery to relevant data to stakeholders. So with those stakeholders being another piece of technology or an individual from and to anywhere in the process, in the process value chain or in the product life cycle. And the other particular offering is around data-driven intelligence, which is very different to what you can actually do in the traditional um, control systems. And that's delivered through advanced algorithms, applications, and digital systems that can, again, effectively and efficiently transform data into value, which is exploitable within the network of things. So I, I just want to kind of park in talking about example opportunities and then allow ourselves to, to have uh, more discussions around uh, the challenges that we have been discussing about uh, and, and whether we see that still to be too idealistic or too ambitious or too futuristic and uh, where do we really stand today. So um, as to close out uh, as a pitch, uh, an example opportunity is the typical predictive maintenance application that we have been seeing uh, already evolving in terms of the, the adoption journey of, of the technologies per se, uh, where predictive maintenance enabled by IoT, it hasn't been just about generating the data or being able to apply um, data science-based algorithms to interpret the data and make decisions, but it's also from where do you access that data and how do you use that data. But also we have started seeing uh, other business models emerging in the back of that. And one of those is around machine servitization. So those different ways of thinking about what is actually beyond generating the data and using the data in your business as usual activities, if you like. That's where, where the expansion of this hyper-connectivity 
uh, start uh, uh, projecting a, a future scale or a future evolution in terms of what is a key differentiation with respect to doing that hierarchically or expanding that uh, into a much more um, heterogeneous way, a much more multidimensional way. Thank you very much. That's really interesting, and you, you, you've 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 used some uh, some terms which I think are, are extremely interesting. I, I like the term data driven intelligence um, as, as an example, and data value, of course, which is very important, and hyper connectivity. Um, now we've got a comment in the chat, which is from Ravindra, which says that there needs to be a longer term vision for digitalizing, transforming the organization, but the smaller steps will help to get to that vision. Now, do, do you agree with that position? I, I, I guess it makes sense. Um, and um, how do you see the role of data-driven intelligence in fulfilling that kind of vision? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that vision. And that goes back to, to the point that, they, that we were making earlier in terms of thinking about that uh, strategic way of generating value for your business and for your business, it, it encompasses everything related to, uh, to what I say at the core and beyond the core of your business. Uh, but how to get to that end goal, it needs to be through a route and that route needs to be defined by those smaller steps that you should take uh, along the route. And along the route is, is to, to achieve that vision, but with that vision also in, including the, uh, the technical considerations that you need to think about. So that takes me back to the previous point again, uh, about uh, avoiding getting to the point where you end up halfway through with a number of different technologies that at the end of the day, they won't maximize on the value of integrating them uh, all together. Uh, in terms of uh, generating um, data-driven intelligence, that starts from those smaller steps. So predictive maintenance is, 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 a, is a very immediate example for that. So you can do predictive maintenance on a single machine, for example, and then do that in three machines, 10 machines, 20 machines, and then moving into different use cases uh, and plan for, for actually maximizing what you're getting out from that network of data applications and different assets within your business and within your supply chains. Right? And those sorts of programs can therefore help to, can be justified in their own right, but they create part of the vision yeah. to have a wider perspective of where you can go in the future. So that's uh, that's yeah. really a good route map, isn't it? Chris, I mean, you're you're also a data man, so, um, so uh, perhaps you might want to comment on that and then uh, I'll ask John Paul and then we'll move back to Luke. Yeah, I think, um... I think the small steps, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a journey, um, I think, to try to um, embark on some of these digitalization projects as a um, as, as one huge step, I suppose. It's just going to be a step too far um, and um, making those uh, those smaller steps or, um, or implementing kind of uh, kind of elements of an overall of an overall program in those smaller steps um, is probably going to be a little bit more palatable. Um, I guess maybe on the flip side of that, the, the the challenge with that is the costs is is the is the initial entry cost then too high because you're breaking things into into steps where there's going to be a lot of repetitive work. Um, whereas if you did something on a much broader or a much larger scale, there'd be efficiency in the delivery of of some of those um, some of those projects. Um, and also as well, may, maybe the return, both maybe the financial return or also the the outcome in terms of what people were expecting does it actually deliver um kind of enough uh, you know enough, enough of that return if you go too small um so maybe there's a there's an offset then between between the cost and and the and and, and the outcome whereas if you went a little bit a little bit bigger went a little bit further with that initial implementation maybe you might get a, mu a much better return or a much a much greater uh, sort of beneficial outcome so i think it's I'm not sure there's one there's one simple answer really it probably again fit you know it has to fit the application and the organization mm -hmm. um, and the the and the challenge that's trying to be solved 
yeah I, I i think that makes a lot of sense as well doesn't it you've, you've got to you've got to look at each individual circumstance and decide from there you know alejandra mentioned um, 3d printing for example you know that would be a great opportunity to introduce a new technology start from um, you know the base of, of of seeing what it could do uh, by integrating into the whole um the whole um plant but at the same time um being of beneficial use in its own right in terms of the data information you can get out of it to make it operate effectively and for predictive maintenance to to, to be available as well so yeah very interesting jean paul well i, I would follow uh, chris in in, in what uh, in what he said and uh, that's what i said in my own uh, presentation uh, don't, don't 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 start small start smart um mm. be specific in in what you want to do um automatically that will be a small step um but it will also be a very practical step um and, and if from that you can you you can measure you can show uh that that, that it brings something um then you will you, you will kick in the the the, the mechanics um that will slowly overcome uh, the, the the show stoppers of uh, uh what will be my return on investment well if you know precisely what you want to do if you want if you know precisely what pain you want to fix um you have already one part of your uh, roi um that, that that is that is clarified um then it's about uh, what you will put in place um but it's basically about keeping things under control and and the only way to do that um is uh, uh yeah as i said being specific in in how you start which implies uh, a, a smaller step of course as i see in the um, in the in the discussion in the chat um there need to be a longer term vision yes and and, and the small step will indeed uh, help you to clarify that vision because it might not be accurate from from the first step you you will have a view and then you will adjust as you uh, as you proceed thank you yes that's very good um while you've been talking we've been concluding a poll of the people on the call this morning um and it is where are you in your digital transformation journey um and uh, we have 32% are at the start. 42% um, describe themselves as midway, which I, I guess is probably where <laughs> I've put myself. Um, only 10% advanced, um, which perhaps is to be expected, and 23% not sure where to start. So, so you know, the the early onset people represent you know more than half. And only ten percent see themselves in a, in an advanced position. Um, first question is: Does it surprise you? Um, and you know, how do you get to be an advanced user? Is it company size dependent? What's holding people back? Would you say? Let's quickly run Jean Paul, Chris, Alejandra, and then Luke. Well. Um, it it's interesting to see that a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people are already engaged in that journey. Um, now, what I would be interested in is to know uh, how they feel about what was said uh, today. Um, what is their uh, feedback on the recipes that were proposed here? Um, uh, is it true that you need to sm start uh, small or, or, or smart? Um, is it true that uh, um, you, you will change your, your, your vision on, on the way to, to, to digitalization? Um, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, it, it, it's my experience, but uh, um, I, I would be interested to hear about the experience of, uh, of, of the others who are uh, engaged in that in that process. Yes, and that's a very good point. Well, here's the opportunity. Um, we're, we're very keen to get comments and, and responses um, either now or if you want to talk to us afterwards, we can facilitate that as well. But yes, let's let's find out the thinking behind the poll that would that would be very helpful for everyone i think chris yeah i don't think i'm i don't think i'm surprised that maybe around half or maybe only at the beginning of that journey i think um 
Um, I think like John Paul alluded to, it would be interesting to poll those that are much more advanced, if you like, and um, find out if they were repeating the exercise again through the journey they've already been through, whether they would do things differently, whether they would have a different approach or what, um, what's, been, what's been a success and what things have been a challenge along, along that journey. The, um, I suppose the resolve, if you like, to continue and they've obviously taken things to to a certain stage where they feel that they're um, in an advanced state. So, um, how has that experience been, and what would they say to those that are just embarking on that on that journey? I guess if they were um, starting again. Yes, um, and of course we can, uh, as as Andy Wiley, who's in the background here, has just reminded me, we can use our LinkedIn profile to keep the discussion going. And we will uh, make sure that our speakers and our audience are engaged, um, so that um, that's a possibility. Um, and um, in the chat, we have the uh, the address of that, so we'll we'll facilitate that after the meeting. Alejandra, you will have seen a, a wide spectrum of organisations. So, um, do, do the poll results reflect what you see? I shall say yes. Uh, and I, I should add to that is exactly the point in, in terms of the diversity that we see uh, from them to see, and that uh, that comes not only uh, across sectors but also based on on scale of the of the manufacturing businesses. So it's very different talking about SMEs uh, than talking about large manufacturers where they even have their own in-house innovation and research capabilities to actually go about. Uh, the development of, uh, of their in-house digital strategies and, and uh, take the journey by themselves, supported by the, the wider ecosystem, but uh, leading by themselves uh, what, uh, what they're about to, to do, not only from the technology perspective, but uh, from that uh, business strategy perspective that we have been talking about. On the SME side, uh, as, we, as we see also in the, in the large manufacturing side, there is always that leader, uh, that actually takes chances and uh, uh, goes for uh, innovate UK bidding, so comes to us uh, uh, with a small capacity for investment, but seeking to that uh, SME support that, they, that we tend to have within the catapult uh, environments. Uh, and there is always that that type of companies that will wait and see what happens and and, and see those uh, expect those evidences actually to come from from those leaders in, in the domain. So we, we do see that diversity and the numbers are, are not really uh, any surprising. Thank you, yes. Right, Luke, well, you can comment on that and then we'll, we'll go into your um, small step energy monitoring system, or maybe it's not that small really, but given the price of energy these days. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so over yeah. to you. Yeah, so there's some uh, really brilliant points as Jean-Paul said start small but smart and think practically. Um, well, how do you do that? Well, the key thing is often, where's the pain? What pain are you experiencing as a customer? Well, I think we're all experiencing the pain of energy costs. Um, over the last two years, uh, we've all seen prices rise to a crazy degree because of two reasons. Obviously, there's the bounce back after COVID where demand has gone through the roof. And then on the supply side, there's the war in the Ukraine, which is reducing our availability of energy. Uh, and in Europe in particular, we've seen prices spike massively. Uh, and so the, the timing of this may be, may be quite nice. So that, where's the pain? The pain is in the energy costs. Uh, how do we address that? Well, the, the nice thing about um, energy consumption is that typically, energy consumption is standardized we all have distribution boxes in our factory those factories all have breaker circuits in them they then distribute the energy to the machines within the factory and so if you want to start small uh, at somewhere which is a pain point you can address it in a standardized logical way be be because what you have in your factory is going to be very similar to what everyone else has in their factory and so uh, what what i'm hoping to show you today very quickly is this energy uh, monitoring kit and the price point is very low so a kit such as this will be around a thousand pound um and there's no licensing all the software on these products is open source uh, the data can be shared from where it is here to your your own system if you wish 
Uh, and so um, what we're trying to do here is give the customer a way to get their foot in the door to start their journey. Yes, I totally agree with uh, Alexandra when she said you need a long-term vision. And the, the long-term vision isn't just about we're suffering because of the cost of our energy. It's also about sustainability. It's also about the climate. It's also about net zero. Um, at your customers, our customers particularly, are demanding from us as a supplier, what is our policy towards sustainability? What is our carbon footprint of the products we deliver? And these kind of requests are becoming more frequent as um, customers become more savvy and they demand more, basically. And we want to be able to supply them more. And so the, there's a dual benefit here. The first benefit is I'm uh, influencing my bottom line. What's my cost? And then the second benefit is I can tell my customer uh, how I'm reducing my impact on the environment. And so we, we think uh, energy monitoring, if you haven't started your journey or if you're some way towards the start of the journey is a really good system to involve in the whole process. Uh, the nice thing about a system like this is that it can live separately initially. You don't have to integrate it with anything if you don't wish to. So very, very quickly, uh, what I've got here is brain boxes where a manufacturer of industrial communication devices like this one. These are devices that connect to machinery, to sensors, to actuators, to data, and then process it in some way and send it out somewhere uh, and like jean paul said 20 years ago he was uh, converting cereal towards ethernet well brain boxes we still we still do that we've been uh, manufacturing cereal devices for 38 years um there's that there's a huge number of machines still out there full of cereal connectivity this particular example i've got one of brain boxes devices which is an edge controller and we've got three submeters. Now, each submeter is monitoring the energy consumption of each of these plugs. One plug is connected to this fridge. One plug is connected to this lav lamp. And one plug is connected to this demo. And we've got open source data collection on here. And we've got an open source dashboard. And in fact, we've got an FAQ on our website, which shows you exactly how to do this for yourself. And it will present data such as this. Now, before I go into the data, something that's very, really interesting is I wasn't sure which of these three things would consume the most energy. I, I actually thought it'd be the fridge, but actually the fridge is the least energy intensive thing out of these three devices. The, the lava lamp is the most energy intensive thing. And so in the last 24 hours, the lava lamp has cost me 25p, whereas the fridge has only cost me 11p to run. Um, and you know we've, we've all got ideas about what the data means, but until you actually see it, then um, you can't really action it properly. And so here, here's some idea of what kind of data you can see. You can see carbon footprint, you can see cost, you can see power consumption, you can see instantaneous power consumption, and you can see a trend over time. And okay, these are three simple um, items here, but the principles are exactly the same in your workshop downstairs. So we have a system just like this downstairs in our factory. Um, and you don't need clever, fancy data metrics to start yeah, actioning what you're seeing. So one of the things we saw was that our oven, which is 20 years old, we didn't want to replace the oven, it still works, why replace it, um, was really energy inefficient. And we knew that, but we didn't know to what degree. And so once you start monitoring the energy consumption, it's really clear what the return on investment is of buying a new oven. So for a very small outlay, it became clear to me my, my initial biggest energy saving could be buying a new oven and the return on investment of that oven would be about two and a half, three years. And like I said, anecdotally, we all knew that, but until we saw the numbers, um, we didn't want to commit to a decision and then the decision became a no brainer. Um, secondly, we, one of our customers uh, is a CNC factory. They have compressors. The compressors are used to power the machines, provide air. They have a primary and a backup. And so when the primary fails, it runs off the backup. Now, what they didn't realize was the primary had failed weeks ago and they were already running off the backup. And then the backup failed and they had nothing. So just monitoring power consumption can give you information about what the machine is actually doing without actually putting sensors on the machine directly. So for example, we have modern machines downstairs and I would break my warranty if I retrofit sensors to some of these modern machines. But you can uh, uninvasively monitor your machines by looking at the energy signature. So to, to give you an example of energy signature, um, here is 
There's some really simple data about when each of those three machines behind me used a piece, a, a, a watt hour of energy. And you can see the patterns of consumption are slightly different. The fridge actually groups together its usage into little chunks, and then it kind of goes into an idle mode before it does the same thing again. And you'll notice that with different kinds of machines, these patterns will tell you what the machine's doing. And with really simple, you can eyeball it initially, but with really simple information, you, you can kind of figure out, okay, how much is data machine up, my machine up for? How many units am I producing? What's the cost per unit produced? Uh, so it will it will lead you on this journey, and like we, like uh, Alexander said, um, a long term vision is essential. But as you make a small step, you kind of move across this uh, hill hilltop, and then you can see a little bit further than you could see before, and you can modify your long term vision as well. So uh, th this is what we think of as a really good small step to to help you get on that journey and start planning how how you get to where you want to go. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I suppose the first, the obvious question is when you move from an isolated measurement to integrating the data, what, what's involved with that? And uh, it ties in quite nicely with the question that's literally just come in from Helen, which is sticking with the theme of starting small. How easy or cost effective would it be to roll out energy monitoring across a vast site? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, like I said, the, uh, distribution boxes in factories are relatively standard. Uh, these energy submeters are relatively standard. To add more submeters, so this particular unit you can connect eight to. If you want to add more, we've got other lower cost units that just uh, sit, capture the data and then send it onto this aggregator. Uh, so, the incremental cost of expanding the system is actually lower than the initial cost. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's expandable. The, the data is open source. And so you already have existing other systems. Um, uh, Chris was talking about all these different layers and how IIoT could be considered as another layer. Uh, and IIoT is often not one thing either. It's often multiple individual things. And so one of the keys to IIoT is how do you get the data out of one of those systems and into the next? And so uh, we're really keen on having open data and being able to easily access things in a secure fashion um, and we're a hardware manufacturer here um, and so we we see these as tools to help us sell the hardware because you know you know with the, this will get you on the journey it'll get you 80 percent of the way there and then you need to speak to a specialist a system integrator who can help you kind of move that forward unless you discover you've got that expertise in-house right well it's obviously inspired some of our um our attendees. Um, John says your energy demo is really cool, Luke. So he's uh, he's obviously interested. And Zach, um, who I happen to know is from Wolverhampton, he's after your address. So uh, so yeah. obviously uh, that might be quite successful. Um, <laughs> so so well done on that. Um, just just to bring us down off the pedestal for a minute and just moving away from uh, an obvious success story. Um, there was a question about uh, one of the barriers, which is which is the the cost and licensing model associated with IIoT software can often be prohibitive for small steps to be taken. So you know, in terms of justifying the investment, thus stifling progress. Is this something vendors need to change and adapt to, or maybe can they change their model to to overcome that problem? Chris, you're you're nodding. Maybe, maybe I'll I'll start with you. Mm. <laughs> Not to stop nodding too much. Um, <laughs> yeah, the um, that is a that's a really interesting question, and I guess um, you know a really it's a really relevant point. Um, I suppose from the vendor's perspective, trying to find that balance between um, where the where the cost, be, well, there's almost a tipping point, isn't there? So in terms of the application, the vendors are trying to sell software, often on a subscription basis. Where do they pitch that annual subscription, knowing that what the customer is really getting is, is often a platform with, let's say, no real boundaries for um, the, the sort of capability of that platform. So if you're going to start small, I guess, then that initial investment in that platform subscription could be seen as prohibitive but over time the more and more you build into that platform the costs don't generally increase or certainly don't increase incrementally there may be a point at which you maybe need a slightly bigger um, 
you know, subscription or some elements to that to that subscription that that, that weren't there before. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I do I do get that that there's a challenge there in terms of how how to balance that. I think maybe what the vendors need to do is find ways of um, maybe having more attractive, whether it's entry level pricing or small scale systems that 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 you quickly grow out of, but at least gets people started on on that journey so they can they can start to see some of those benefits um, and particularly while there's maybe that encouragement around starting small or starting smart is is the entry level costs then too, too high that do that do prohibit people from even even starting that journey um, I don't know whether you guys ever have uh, you know vent, vendors on these types of conversations that we could pose some of those questions to directly but it's um, it's certainly something that I'd be interested in talking to um, our primary partner about um, and seeing what their their thoughts are on that. John Paul, uh, starting smart cost effectively. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, um, so, some software are indeed more expensive, or their licensing is expensive. Um, but may, maybe it's not the software in which people should invest at that stage in their journey. Maybe that's something for, for the future. Maybe what they want to do uh, can be done differently um, in, uh, as a smaller scale, um, ju just to start and to get the ball rolling. Um, there are many solutions uh, and many ways to, to, to achieve a, a, a few first steps in, in, in the journey. Uh, at very reasonable cost. Um, there are th there is hardware that is autonomous, um, where there is no license fee. Well, we've seen one one example with with Luke. There's many other hardware like that, where um, maybe it's already verticalized. Maybe there is some development, but you, you can already start there. And the value of that more expensive software will only come when you scale it up. Um, so. Probably, uh, I, I, I would come back to the, the first step, be specific. Um, the, we start an IoT journey because we want to fix a pain, because we want to do some savings, because we have an objective. We don't start an, uh, an IoT journey because we want to do some IoT. Um, it, it's a tool, and, and that software is, is a tool like, uh, like all the others. Uh, it certainly fits the the um, the use case that the manufacturer had in mind um may, maybe we're not yet in that use case um and uh, and it will come later in the journey Alejandra do you do you come across this um as a barrier when you're dealing with your clients yeah and I should say even ourselves we have very that point when accessing a piece of technology to either develop our own capabilities or proving a concept to a particular customer, and we end up uh, having to renew a license for something that we don't necessarily have a high utilization for. So it's, it's, it's real. Uh, but I think that's also um, a result from, from the current market, the current demand. So the stats give us a reference on, on, on what is actually the, um, the market that is paying for the technologies. And I think in terms of a, do they need to change or not, I think they will eventually change. They will carry on maturing. A lot of the technologies out there are coming from startups, from scale-ups, so new businesses in the play and the, 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 the backing, the financial uh, support that they have or the financial uh, strategy that, that they have across uh, against that business will have to carry on evolving as, uh, as the market demand also evolves. Uh, and uh, also, what are to be the considerations around the, the different business models where in some cases you have uh, the opportunity to, to leverage or to capitalize on the data or where you will have the opportunity to capitalize on the assets themselves, so being the network or being the physical, the hardware devices themselves, or being the, the access to, to your own platforms or to the, the, your own subscription to, to existing IoT platforms or hosting platforms. So those changes I will foresee, they will continue evolving. Uh, and this is only a consequence of the actual market dynamics that we see still in, in these early times. 
yeah I, I i think it is it is very much about um new business models really and I, you know that a lot of these are emerging you know the, the rolls royce idea of of airlines paying for distance traveled rather than the engine up front or i've seen a similar thing in vertical hoists for a construction industry where you you actually pay for the number of meters of lift that you've um, you've used so that these all become much more cost effective especially in early stages or for small users so so i'm sure those sorts of models can be applied to um, iiot software as well we're, we're doing really well we've we've done our 75 minutes and i have one more rather interesting question which is a bit of a curveball for you all um and it's it's about the future application of AI, artificial intelligence in this area, and, and where do you perhaps see that going? Um, I've um, come back from a weekend with a former business partner of mine, good friend in, based in Cambridge, and we're, we're looking at uh, chat GBT, which is uh, GPT, which is a, um, uh, a, an AI model, which, um, you know, who knows, it might get rid of people like me before too long, because it writes its own articles and can do all that. And, um, and I've actually, I've actually put a question into chat GPT while we've been talking. And it's come up with a pretty decent answer, but nothing like the colour or the background that any of our speakers have, um, have, have, have brought to the subject. So I, I think you're all fine in terms of not being replaced by an, an AI, AI model. Um, but but where where would you see AI taking us in terms of um, manufacturing e efficiency, digitalization? Um, who wants to start that one? It's a bit of a curveball, isn't it? Uh, let's start with Luke. Uh, all, uh, my view is uh, AI has gone from being peddled as snake oil to actually having a legitimate place within the environment of manufacturing. Um, and, and its legitimacy is only just starting to kind of show itself to us all because of the uh, all these innovations from OpenAI with ChatGPT, et cetera. But I mean, if I was to look at this really broadly, I would say that primarily the, the things that are initially going to get receive the most benefit from this is digital tasks in the digital world, because um, these AIs operate digitally and they can manipulate digital things exceptionally well. Uh, and you can see once we can uh, convert our analog voices into something digital, then chat GPT can work with that and it can understand the input and it can generate an, an, an exceptional output. So initially it will up, up, it will take on tasks which are in the digital world because this digital technology is so, it is so dexterous within that environment, right? But in the physical world, there's still a long way to go. So there are, there are plenty of robotic AI like things and that are uh, under development, but from my point of view that they're technologically quite way behind. Um, you can apply AI to a, a machine, but it doesn't make the machine move like a human, right? So there, there are plenty of aspects of the machinery which isn't yet ready to take be taken advantage of by the AI. Um, and, and so br broadly speaking, if most of what we do on this call, and I suspect most of our uh, people in the audience, uh, a lot of our role revolves around digital tasks. We're interacting with our laptops. We're typically not interacting with the physical things on our production lines. And so I, I basically said to my production guys not so long ago, you're, in some respects, your jobs are the safest in the whole company, right? I've got people sitting upstairs working at their desks, uh, but their roles are far more likely to be done by uh, an AI than the people who, who require to be uh, manipulating the physical objects on the production line. So it's, it's again, it's, a, it's an evolution, but initially my, my view is any kind of uh, artistic, digital uh, or data manipulation tasks are prime for some kind of AI, and then longer term, maybe physical real world tasks. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think um, I think similar to um, IIoT. Really, I think um, it's going to be down to the individual use cases, and we'll find some more obvious um, use cases get tackled first. Um, I think I completely agree with Luke's point. Really, that 
um, those those sort of systems or where there's already digital interaction is where those use cases are going to present themselves to begin with. Um, we're already seeing some of those things in, in certain areas already. Um, and the uh, I suppose really the proliferation then is going to just come down to what what level of success there is in, in those uh, in those elements and how they can be, I suppose, like packaged up into um, uh, something that 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 can be described and repeated almost that can be then used by others almost productized so like we 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 talk a lot now about predictive maintenance and those those types of things that certain lab elements of machine learning and that kind of thing behind them um so finding those use cases that are then can then be packaged up and repeated in other areas are probably going to be well we'll see the um you know the, the sort of greatest proliferation i suppose in the beginning thank you alejandra yeah, as I said, the, the limits are, are certainly in, in that scope, the physical scope, uh, but also the ethical aspects uh, that are associated to what concerns the manufacturing environment and, uh, and anything associated with that. And that starts from the point on, uh, on, on how do you generate data or whether you get data to train algorithms, for example, that starts with an ethical aspect as well. And all of that starts covering all the rest of, uh, of things that you do with that data to build your, your artificial intelligence algorithms. So I will combine safety and ethical aspects all together to define that limitation on how far AI is actually to, to go. Behind that, uh, we need still to evolve uh, around uh, policies that will actually ensure that this is the, uh, the domain of concern that will we establish those boundaries and how far it can actually be taken. We have seen that AI can go really far, but we need to keep that uh, uh, within the right balance. And similar to uh, to Chris' talk around, uh, and my own talk actually, around uh, the hierarchies, I think that backbone within the automation domain will continue existing mm -hmm. because of the determinism that you need in there, because of the reliability that you need for your physical production systems and anything around that is that um, that level of allowance that you can actually have around the implementation of new technologies uh, in relation to, to what your requirements are within your production environment and your business environment. And it's, it's clear that also the requirements will vary uh, all across different businesses, but there will be common aspects and those common aspects will continue being around people and, and around uh, these companies. Yes, thank you for mentioning um, the, the ethical and safety issues, which which is certainly something that we were discussing at the weekend. You know that um, AI in the hands of bad actors, or um, or even just as a result of poor programming, can be quite a dangerous technology as well. So, as you say, as you all say, there's a long way to go. Um, so, for the purposes of symmetry, we started with Jean Paul, so we'll we'll ask him to finish on this topic. All right, thank you. Um, well, uh, AI works on data, and there is a, a comment in the in the chat about uh, um, regardless of the potential capabilities of AI in the future, companies to digitally transform first. Um, that's that, that's uh, well. I, I would agree with that uh, with that statement indeed. Um, uh, it, it, it is the discovery of a new tool, uh, a new thing. Um, we are still in the process of digitalizing the, the, the industry. Um, the, the, the methodology uh, is still being built day, day by day. And now we have this new tool. Um, either we make our half of the bridge uh, to, to generate data to reach that tool, or that tool will um, adjust to fit the hand um, and, and become helpful to, to us. And, and it will go the, the, the two ways, I, I guess, like it did for other, other technologies. Um, so um, nice interesting um let's look into it in on the larger future but let's talk again maybe not in 10 years but in three five years and see how uh, how this bridge is being built definitely and we'll see how far that uh, our, uh, our 10 percent of people in advanced state of digitalization how, how that might have improved in three to five years and and we had one last comment actually from uh, matthew in the defense industry 
talking about the uh, importance of keeping data safe and that could be a potential stumbling block but not notwithstanding that i think it, you know it it, it it, it's a very positive future that we're looking at through digitalization and ultimately through some very futuristic tools that we might be able to exploit then. Um, with that, I'm going to draw it to a close and thank you very much to, to our speakers for a superb um, um, discussion this morning. I'm sure we could have carried on for another hour, but uh, needs must. Um, we, have a, we have a couple of closing notices. First of all, um, following Luke's presentation, our next talking industry in a month's time is actually on the subject of energy efficiency. So it's uh, logical that we 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 take that forward and certainly looking at the level of interest that we had while you were speaking, that's um, that's going to be a very popular one. Um, and finally, um, I need to draw your attention to a live format of of this in uh, in April. And to ensure that I don't get it wrong, I'm going to invite my colleague Andy Wiley to turn his camera and his sound on, and then he can tell you all um, in much more accuracy than I can exactly what that's about. Yes, thank you, Andrew, uh, Andy. <clears throat> so, um, following some of the themes of today's conversation and in a live format, actually at the MTC, which uh, some of you may see behind Alejandra. Uh, we'll be launching Talking Industry Live uh, for the first time. Uh, it follows the same themes as Talking Industry in its digital format. Lots of open discussion, lots of learning opportunities around the themes of robotics and automation, increasing OEE uh, through digital manufacturing. We touch on uh, industrial data and AI, uh, in-depth workshops on uh, managing uh, equipment safety, and cybersecurity in the modern factory, along with uh, smart panel building um, and everything in between. So we'd like to extend a, a warm invitation to everybody that's on the call today to register for that free live event uh, at the MTC on the 25th of April this year. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And so once again, thanks very much to our panelists for this morning and to everybody who attended um, through the chat and, and online. So hope you found it worthwhile and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.